you know, people in an office. And that's why I love having my practice and then having an excuse to go into school, you know, or did. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to start letting people in. Okay. Could I? So Let's see if I can do that. See if you could admit all. So you have that access. There. Oh my goodness, all these people. Shall we start, Evan, do you think? I don't want to. Yes, we should. It's a little after four. Oh, here. No, wait. I'm going to wait a couple more minutes just for. I'm going to start because it's a little after four. Um, so I'm Sarah Trotbetter, and I am part of the um, lecture committee at Morgan State's School of Architecture and Planning. And I am um, happy to present and introduce our first lecture. So uh, good afternoon and welcome to the School of Architecture and Planning's first lecture of the fall 2020 lecture series titled Aptly Uncharted Territories. We are indeed entering or are in the middle of uncharted territory. And I hope that you have all weathered this crazy time relatively unscathed. Today, I am very pleased to introduce Ming Hu as our opening lecturer of the fall lecture series. Professor Hu is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at the University of Maryland at College Park. She teaches technology courses which focus on the integration of architectural design with structural, material, and building performance assessment. With an extensive background in high performance, building design and life cycle assessment, Professor Hugh has engaged in applied building technology research for over 16 years. Her research activities center on questions of how and why sustainable building design and construction 
affect energy and resource conservation, environmental and human health, and seek to understand how smart technologies might be employed to reduce the impact from buildings. Her first book titled Net Zero Building, Predicted and Unintended Consequences will be the subject of this afternoon's lecture. Please join me in welcoming Ming Hu to Morgan State's School of Architecture and Planning. So Ming. Okay. Um, thank you very much for having me today. It is really uh, my great pleasure to talk with you all. Because um, I know I have been uh, communicating with Sarah for, I guess, for um, a while. I uh, want to share with you all what I have learned during the process writing up this book. Uh, so today I'm going to mainly focus on uh, this book and hopefully I can have enough time at the end so we can have more uh, interaction and a live discussion. Um, so I'm going to talk about why I wrote this book, Net Zero Energy Building, and what is in this book and what is unique about this book. Uh, so first, why I wrote this book. Um, I found I was in practice and in teaching in universities. Students and colleagues come back to me with similar questions. Uh, where can I find more information about Net Zero Energy Building? What is Net Zero Energy Building? And what is the benefit to build Net Zero Energy Building? I found each time I have to send my colleagues and students to multiple resources of rather excellent books like this or journal paper, but the rather large volume and rather diverse and sometimes even conflicting information. And quite often my colleagues and students just do not have enough time to absorb all those information. So at the end, they still left a feeling like only have superficial understanding of the Nether Energy Building. So I came up with this idea uh, to write a book, particularly on Nether Energy Building based on a hybrid research method, both qualitative theoretic discussion from social science perspective and the quantitative engineering findings based on empirical research. So my goal is to provide the reader a balanced and holistic view. So I wrote this book to ensure the book will go further and deeper uh, than other current and the commonly used uh, books and the text on net zero energy building to take a critical look at uh, the overall energy consumption and carbon emission reduction from a whole life cycle perspective. And this book um, try to present a holistic overview of a different net zero energy uh, building approaches and their related consequences, both positive and unintended, meaning the negative one. So what is in this? Uh, so this is why I want to write this book. Uh, what is in this book? Altogether, this book has eight chapters and uh, close to uh, 400 reference, uh, references and um, more than 50 figures and tables. And all those figures and the tables uh, were created by my research assistant and myself starting from scratch. And more importantly, at the end of the book, the last two chapter, um, I propose a, a new concept, at least a new conceptual frame to define the net zero impact building. So let me walk you through what is include, uh, included in this book. So first, the chapter. Uh, chapter one sets the stage uh, for understanding the development and the practice of net zero energy, uh, net zero concept in recent decades worldwide. And the first figure uh, that you see on the screen right now, this is the first figure in the book. It is a historic development map of net zero energy building. So the concept of net zero energy flow was first introduced in around 1930 
by renowned chemist uh, Frederick Soddy, who was a Nobel Prize winner. And between 1930s and the 1980s, uh, lots of technology that we are using currently in natural energy building was invented uh, test and tested in the, this really important project called the MIT Solar House Project, uh, which span almost 50 years time span. Altogether, six solar house, six nearly nether energy building was the result of this large um, decades long, more than decades long research project in MIT. And the first built and verified true net zero energy building was a small house built in Denmark in 1977 as a research project. And after the research team built the project and monitor the, pro uh, the, the house operation and collect the one year worth of operational data, the house, um, actually the research project was disassembled. The house was uh, uh, taken down. But um, in the following decades, a lot of researchers who's focusing on uh, energy efficiency studies, at least in Europe, uh, actually used the set, the first set of uh, data from net zero, the true net zero energy building did a lot of analysis. Okay. And the first design guideline, which uh, is mostly closely resembled the current, the existing net zero energy design, requirement is this um, passive house standard. Probably all, a lot of you heard about it. Um, the passive house standard was established in 1988, uh, also as a result of a research project, but this time it's in Germany. So the first, first systematic definition, true definition, and uh, a formal definition of a net zero energy building was indeed proposed in United States, regardless of all the good work um, before 2000 uh, that happened in Europe. The first set of systematic definition of net zero energy building was, in, was from United States in 2006. Uh, it was proposed and, uh, and studied by a group of researchers and a scientist from DOE, Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Lab. So probably by now you'll get a sense that uh, the real interest and the consensus built around net zero energy building is a pretty recent one. Uh, so move forward and in 2010, the European Union proposed the concept of a nearly net zero energy, uh, or they call it nearly net zero. And the EU, European Union also mandate all member states has to reach the nearly net zero energy goal by actually 2020, which is this year. And so after the 2010 directive, all those EU member states have developed their own strategies and the technologies and the pathways uh, to achieve this directive goal. And some countries even push a little further, for example, Norway and Switzerland include uh, go beyond the operation energy. Actually, they include the embodied energy when they set up the pathway to meet the nearly net zero energy goal. And the Germany, the Germany set up a net zero carbon emission goal. Again, one step further than net zero energy. And France wants to be positive energy. So apparently net zero energy is uh, no longer enough uh, 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 for them. So you probably wonder what happened in other parts of the world besides uh, North America, besides uh, uh, Europe. Lots have happened and are happening right now. For example, in Japan and China, um, those countries both created the nationwide net zero energy requirement and put the logistic reinforcement and the financial incentives around this net zero energy goal. And Australia and New Zealand also has their uh, own carbon emission reduction goal. Uh, so if you look at overall what's happening globally around the world, it is absolutely a pity that the United States quit the Paris Agreement and going backwards, going the wrong direction. 
Okay, so this is what you can find in chapter one, continue on chapter two. Chapter two um, basically wants to direct uh, reader's attention to the science behind net zero, and, uh, net zero concept, how we calculate the energy flow, what does it mean by zero energy. Um, four major net zero definition are compared in a global context by examining the exemplary buildings in different countries, United States, Norway, Netherlands, and Hong Kong. And the four definitions I focused on uh, uh, on in chapter two are net zero site energy, net zero source energy, net zero emission, and the net zero cost. Those are uh, all slightly different from each other. Both has pros and cons. And I don't think I have time to go into detail today, but if you're interested, we can have a discussion conversation a, a little bit later. Okay, chapter three. Chapter three, um, try to shift the conversation, guiding the readers through major positive influences of uh, energy efficiency movement. And additionally, this chapter sets the tone to transition to a discussion of those unintended consequences. So chapter four, for first provides an overview of net zero definition and its development and in involvement in ecologic eco economics to contrast its parallel version in the building environment. Then chapter four, this chapter dives deeper into the three major unintended consequences of the current net zero energy uh, movement in the built environment. I will explain a little later what are those three unintended uh, consequences. Following the chapter three and uh, four, chapter five takes a close global look at the five main drivers behind the predicted development trend. Those five drivers are environment, environmental driver, regulatory driver, human health driver, technology driver, and economic driver. And chapter six actually dive into one of the driver, which is technology driver, closely examined advanced building material technologies and assemblies used commonly used in net zero energy building and I try to provide reader with a comprehensive understanding of the potential environmental and the human health impact of those advanced and energy efficient materials and assembly. Again, this impact are both positive and negative. And the chapter seven, um, chapter seven serves to synthesize the preceding chapters. And this chapter also introduced, started to introduce this new concept of net zero energy building. And the evaluation and the measurement are introduced, how we uh, evaluate the impact of the uh, net zero building um, also be introduced, started being introduced in this chapter, chapter seven. And the lastly, the chapter eight presents three build project. Uh, what you are seeing on the screen is one of those build project is a, is a building called Edge located in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. Uh, so chapter eight present those three build project to demonstrate um, what a net zero impact building could look like and what kind of a design process and uh, material selection technology selection process should and could look like uh, if, you, if your aim and goal is to build a net zero impact building instead of a net zero energy building. At the end of the chapter eight, uh, a comparative a summer, summary was provided to compare the differences among those three build projects. And also the common lessons was draw from those three build projects. Okay, so those are um, eight chapters that included in this book. Now let's look at, uh, let's just talk a little bit what is unique uh, from, at least from my perspective, what is uh, different about this book. Um, there are three uniqueness or differences uh, of this book compared to other uh, related net zero energy uh, doc documentation books or papers. Um, first, this book 
try to provide an overview of net zero development worldwide and compare their differences. Um, the existing majority of the existing uh, net zero book are actually focused on case study and focus on one or two particular geographic location, either in United States or European, uh, uh, European Union countries. And this book really try to provide a broader and global uh, scale and a global view. Um, so during the research, in order really to understand what's happening around the world, um, my research assistant and I are actually created this Google map uh, to track all the built and the verified Nether Energy building. Uh, let me see whether I can share with you this, uh, this Google map here. Here we go. So this is a Google map, a live Google map and uh, open to anyone who are interested. So ideally, um, if anyone interested, they can put continue add on this map. Um, and so that this could be used uh, a kind of a graphic database for anyone who are interested in research uh, topic related to net zero or nearly net zero energy building. Um, so this, Google map is organized by building types, residential uh, building office, commercial office building and educational building. And some, uh, and some building has more information than others. For example, this one uh, has the information about the year of this building built and the size of this building and uh, uh, different kind of EUI. Um, this is uh, the base, uh, the, the site EUI and the source EUI. And also some building, uh, you will find the ZEPI uh, score information of some building. Um, in terms of the geographic, this, oops, this map covered, you can find a project in United States, <coughs> sorry, in Europe, of course, there's a lot. And also some project uh, in Asia. Uh, we started actually from this semester, we started collect information about built and verified natural energy building in China, in Korea, um, and in other parts of the Asia, we did not find um, case building before. Okay. To here. Okay, go back to the slides here. So that is the map uh, again for if any of you are interested to use this map or to add on this map, uh, feel free to contact me after, after this talk. Okay, so this is the first uh, uniqueness about this book and the second uh, difference and unique, uniqueness about this book is this book try to address both sides of net zero energy development. Uh, again, good and bad. Uh, unintended and um, positive and unintended. The third uniqueness is this book goes one step further to advocate net zero impact building, aiming to mitigate those, uh, some of those unintended consequences that are derived or induced by the current net zero energy building practice and the movement. So before I jump into uh, those three unintended consequences. Um, let's just first take a quick, really quick look about the good, good things about net zero, net zero energy building, the benefit, the predicted um, and no benefit. So in this book, uh, this book uh, try to outline both direct and indirect benefits. The direct benefits include the utility uh, cost reduction the conservation of resources, materials, and improvements in direct work productivity and occupants' well being and health. So, those are direct benefits. The indirect benefits include labor force building. For example, um, the, the building, a highly efficient building, give 
uh, the job market opportunity to, to train or retrain the existing labor force so that they can have new skill sets, either install, it could be install PV panel on the roof or could be install uh, the highly efficient uh, retrofit, um, highly efficient mechanic system on the existing building. So this kind of indirect benefits uh, can be associated with net zero energy building or related to the green building, sustainable building in general. Other direct benefits uh, include the social uh, and the community uh, building. So those are all the good things. I'm pretty sure um, most of us are aware about not only just the net zero energy building, but in general, sustainable building. Uh, but for the negative impact, for the unintended consequences, there are three major unintended consequences I try to outline in this book. The first one is, uh, the first unintended consequence is the environmental impact, the negative environmental impact associated with embodied energy, which is mainly derived from the use of uh, uh, advanced but energy intense material, such as metal, such as glass, um, even concrete. Um, those materials often being used in uh, high performance building often being used in newer construction. Uh, the second unintended consequences are the unintended uh, social impact. So technically speaking, based on the current definition and the calculation method of uh, net, zero, un, net zero side energy building in the United States, those single family detached house located in suburban area has highest potential to become net zero site energy building, simply just because it has a spread out building footprint and a roof area um, to install enough solar voltaic panel, the PV panel so that they can offset the energy use. But that, uh, but the, the suburban lifestyle is often associated with a longer commute and the higher energy use intensity per capita. So if we count the transport energy, embodied energy and induced energy of those single family uh, house, um, especially single family house in a less dense suburban area, it actually consume more energy than those in the apartment building located in a dense urban area. So this is actually being uh, studied intensely in Europe uh, but not it's, it, it's, it has not been a popular uh, topic in United States yet. So even though for those buildings located in the suburban area, especially located in uh, middle class or, or upper class wealthy suburban area, even though those buildings can afford to install PV panel uh, so that it can generate energy on site to offset the energy will be consumed uh, in the house. However, the actual energy consumption and the related uh, environmental impact still exist and is still high. Um, so in fact, this kind of uh, development trend and uh, um, this development trend uh, pattern can actually intensify the inequality in terms of energy and the material distribution. Okay, so that is a second unintended consequences all often being overlooked. The third unintended consequences uh, is a little straightforward is the eco ecological degradation, which I'm going to explain a little bit later when I start to talk, uh, when I start to explain what is uh, net zero impact, okay? But uh, the ecological degradation is mainly related again to the building materials that are selected and used in those, uh, in those net zero energy building and also the construction method and construction flow around and associated with those high energy, uh, high performance building. So those are the three unintended consequences and uh, all those unintended consequences are related are caused by the incomplete definition and the counting method in the existing net zero energy building definition, at least in the United States. 
uh, there are three major missing components in our current uh, practice uh, for net zero energy building. The first missing component is embodied energy, meaning the energy goes into the building materials, goes into building the building, uh, meaning construction, and also the energy goes into repair and maintain the building. The second missing component is the transport energy, meaning the building used by the building users and the building occupants on commute. The third missing component is the induced energy, meaning the energy related, um, meaning the energy and activities associated or induced by uh, the current lifestyle and overall use of those buildings. In order to include and integrate those missing components, what we need uh, is to design a building from a whole life cycle perspective. Uh, we need to think about not only what kind of a building materials we want to use, but also consider how, where those materials comes from and how the, those raw ingredients being extracted and transported to the factory. We need to think about not only what kind of a facade system we want to use, but also whether we prefer an offsite construction method or we want to build every single thing on site, build every single thing on job site. And we need to think about not only what types of lighting fixtures, mechanic units uh, that can be energy efficient or provide enough illuminance for us, but we also need to consider what type of fixtures and equipment has longer time span, therefore, de uh, therefore demand less repair and maintenance. And lastly, we need to think about not only how we can rebuild uh, a new and energy efficient building, but also we need to think about how we can recycle and reuse every single piece of the brick from the old and existing building. So truly, um, typically I will see um, as a designer, as at least as architecture designer, we tend to focus on three and four, and we tend to ignore or do not want to think about one, two, and five. But in order to truly build a sustainable building, we really should consider every single uh, life stage that associate with building a building or retrofit a building. And besides those missing um, components by taking the life cycle consideration, there are additional important impact indicators uh, we should consider, we should integrate, uh, such as the impact, the building impact on land, the building impact on environment, larger environment ecosystem, and uh, the building impact on water system and the building impact on human health. So those are all the things we, um, as a design profession, we tried but haven't done a very good uh, job yet, but we can definitely improve. To, so to achieve the net zero impact goal, uh, the book at uh, the last two chapters, the book uh, tried to argue uh, ecological approach is needed. And the most promising ecological approach in the built environment actually is the life cycle approach. Um, so, it's, so if you think about it, it's, start, it's, it's, uh, it's become important actually to teach the, uh, the current students uh, the life cycle approach, even the life cycle assessment. So in the last two chapters, the book proposed the four separate but interrelated life cycle assessment. Uh, as you can see on the screen, life cycle energy assessment, water assessment, environmental impact assessment, and life cycle human health assessment. Under each of the assessment, there is a subtopics and subcategories can go very, uh, can go as complicated as you want. But overall, the bottom line is uh, we have to not only just focusing on energy performance, we really need to start to think about how we can evaluate the building impact after building being completed, after being building put being put in place, instead of just solely focus on energy uh, performance. So the idea is in order to have a truly sustainable building, energy conservation is a good start. Uh, we start from there, 
However, it can lead to some unintended consequences as I outlined a little earlier. And those negative impacts has been ignored uh, or discounted for a while. Um, some so-called green building, even lead planet uh, building, in fact, could be very environmental friend, unfriendly, uh, unfriendly and social unfair. Uh, think about this way, think about this scenario. Um, for a super high rise building um, built in Abu Dhabi, actually it is a project I have worked on before. So super high rise building in Abu Dhabi, all building materials, including the curtain wall, including every single uh, facade system, facade material, were imported from China. And the raw materials came from Africa and South America. Meanwhile, the major mechanic system, mechanic units were imported, at least with, uh, were bought from Germany, but it needs to be sent back to Indonesia to get it repaired uh, and the tombs. Um, and this building was designed by a leading AE firm, United States, uh, who, uh, the firm I worked for before and uh, being evaluated as uh, the number one leading firm in sustainable design. Um, and that building actually get the lead planning certification. However, the, the true eco footprint of this building is gigantic, it's ginormous, ginormous and the most negative bad environment impact and a human health impact happened outside of the building boundary um, and outside of Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi and outside of the United States mainly happened in the developing countries. Um, but the current net zero energy building practice in the United States does not fully take into all of those into consideration. So we could end up design and build and produce the buildings actually opposite, opposite, exactly opposite to our original intention to do good and to the environment, to do good to, uh, to the human race. Um, and uh, to ex some extreme scenario, we can even in a way, we can even help to deepen the inequality at the global scale. Um, Therefore, the more holistic view is really needed. We really need to look into the, again, the potential impact from the whole life, whole building life cycle um, from multiple aspects, instead of just focusing on the energy performance, just focusing on the energy measurement so that in that way, we can be responsible for the entire building life cycle consequences. So that is a uh, really quick and a brief uh, description of my book. I think now I'm looking forward to hear your feedback and I'm open for any question you might have. Thank you so much, Ming, that was wonderful. Um, I think for questions, the easiest thing might be for people to just type them into the chat and then I can ask them, um, translate. <laughs> Um, rather than having people kind of shout out. I have one question, which I, um, you mentioned um, net zero site en energy versus net zero source energy. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what that is a little bit? And you had the four different types. Sure. So basically the uh, difference between site and source is uh, for the site, we count all the energies that happen within the building site, the building boundary, the property boundary. And for the source energy is we count the energy that it happened at the energy source, meaning the power plants. Uh, give you an example. Uh, let's see, um, we all know the energy conversion rate uh, for the electricity is uh, almost uh, one to three or three to one, meaning you have to generate three parts of the energy. Let's see, uh, uh, 3000 kilowatts hours energy on in the power plants in order to deliver 1000 kilowatts energy to the buildings because there is energy loss during the uh, transmission, right? So that is a ratio three to one. So for a site, natural site energy, as long as uh, you can produce 1000 kilowatts, uh, kilowatts energy on site through the PV panel, through the renewable, uh, resources, then you meet the site net zero energy goal. But in order to become a source energy, 
uh, source net zero energy, you have to, on the site, you have to produce 3,000 kilowatts hour energy on the building site through the renewable energy source. So in this way, meeting the goal of source energy is uh, much higher and more difficult uh, to meeting the site energy, uh, site, net zero site energy goal. Unfortunately, uh, most uh, United, uh, United States, most uh, net zero energy building uh, are net zero energy site building or site and net zero energy building. And not source, that's interesting. And then my last question is, what, what is the ZEPI score? Does that um, stand for zero project impact or? Uh, ZEPI stands for, oh, good question. Uh, I, now I forgot the, the, the full name. So it's a, uh, not impact, it's zero, I think it's zero performance. So basically ZEPI score is a different kind of measurement to measure how well, how well your building perform against the baseline. Um, so the, the current, the baseline is 100. You want to be as lower as, uh, as possible because uh, if you uh, consume 40% energy less than the baseline, then your ZP score is going to be 60. Um, so this is a uh, this is just an easy way for a lot of layperson to uh, to use to conceptualize the performance of the building against uh, the baseline. Again, the baseline is a really really low standard. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, so we do have one question from Tim. Tim, I don't know your last name, Tim. Um, but Tim, do you cover or can recommend sources for retrofitting existing homes or buildings to net zero or positive energy? So basically the idea of, of retrofitting an existing house to mm -hmm. fill the net energy. Yeah, this is a, thank you for asking this question. This is a very important question. And this is a, a current trend right now, um, especially in developed the country. Um, because by 20, 2030, 80% uh, 80%, uh, 80 of our building stock will be 20 years old or older, meaning it's the first kind of first life cycle we start to, we need to start to think about the retrofit upgrades. Uh, so that is a really uh, a tremendous needs. Um, there are, to answer your question directly, uh, there are quite a lot of good resources uh, for retrofit existing buildings to become net zero. And the DOE starting from 2014, Actually, from 2012, DOE produced at least five um, design guidelines. They call it design guidelines or a different term. So basically, um, and each each volume, each report focusing on uh, a special type of the building. So they produce a report, a guideline for school building, for retrofitting a school building. And also they have a report on retrofitting office building. Uh, they are working on and planning to publish a report and a guideline to retrofit house, house, um, multifamily house and a single family house. So there are quite a lot of good resources uh, if you are into uh, retrofitting existing building. The truth is um, retrofitting building might be more difficult uh, than building a new building. Um, not because of the technical difficulty, it's because um, incomplete documents and information we have on the existing building. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was great. That was interesting. Um, Ryan Eubanks is one of our architecture students. Um, in areas where there is not raw materials available and or mechanical systems produced, what is the answer for getting the products without posing impacts to developing countries? Would it be localizing? Good question as well. Uh, actually, great question. Yes, uh, the only the only way and only solution is uh, use local material as much as possible, um, and also not only just the material, but also use the localized or the local construction method as much as possible. Um, Kamalash Penti is uh, one of our construction management professors. 
He is asking, how is, the health, how is the healthy air quality of these net zero buildings maintained for high rise buildings and single family houses? Healthy air quality of this. Um, okay, uh, let me answer this question in two parts uh, because you're talking about different building type. Um, for single family house, one great, great, uh, very good resources and uh, the design guideline you can look at is passive house standard. Um, passive house is, um, is this type of the house not only super energy efficient, um, it definitely can achieve net zero energy goal, but also it has superior um, indoor air quality. Uh, the way they did it is from a tightly controlled building envelope as well as a very, very complicated and sophisticated HVAC system. Um, so the, what we typically see is the energy efficiency is not conflict, it's not, um, it's not contradictory to a high indoor quality, including uh, indoor air quality. Most of the time, um, those two goals and the two approach will converge, will merge at together. Uh, because essentially what we're looking at is a highly high performance building, right? Um, the performance, when we talk about performance, not only just energy performance, but also include the indoor air performance, the lighting performance and the sound performance. So that is for the, for the uh, single family house, I will ask, uh, I will recommend you to look at the passive house standard. Um, and for the high rise building, it depends. Depends whether you are talking about uh, office building or you talk about the mixed use the building. Um, there are a, uh, a lot different mitigation strategy in order to control the air quality in a high rise building. Um, I want to say this, uh, just to be honest, I do not think in United, in, in United States, we have a, a lot of good example to look at, especially for mid to high rise office building. Um, but we can look into the example, the design uh, code requirement regulation design guideline in Europe and Asia. Um, there, the, the, you will find the, the fundamental and the basic design approach as very different. Even if you look at the uh, building footprint are very different uh, from, uh, from what you can find those bulky and super large block building. Um, block high-rise office building. Um, so I, this, this, this is a good question, but I, I think I really cannot just answer in one or two sentences, but we can definitely have a more one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one conversation so I can show you some good examples. He should give, give a lecture to his class. <laughs> um, Laurel McSherry is um, asking, she's our program director for landscape architecture that we have some students in the audience that are currently developing thesis proposals. Could you speak a bit more about the difference between the book you intended to, com um, to write compared to the book you ultimately wrote? So in other words, the act of writing a book or undertaking design research as an act of discovery. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, thank you for asking. So initially I can tell you um, my, my thought process and also uh, where I was before I write the book and afterwards. Uh, so when I start to, to think about writing the book, um, I thought net zero energy building is the only and the single solution to a lot of uh, problem, right? Because um, my core research is still is energy uh, modeling life cycle assessment. So I truly believed net zero energy building is the solution, um, solution for everything. And, uh, and at the back of my mind, I know there's going to be some, uh, some unintended consequences. I was not very clear the scope and extent of those uh, unintended consequences. And also I was not very clear the, uh, the magnitude, uh, how, how bad it could be. Um, 
So during the research, uh, actually it's a, almost a three year research uh, effort uh, back in, uh, on and off. Um, when I approached to the end, um, meaning when I started to write the last two chapters and I want to look back about, uh, look at all the research and all the information I collected on those unintended consequences and, um, and the step far back, far, far, far back from the net zero building I used to know, uh, I realized um, my understanding of net zero energy building has definitely changed a lot. Um, that's, that's part of the reason why it prompted me to propose this net zero impact building instead of solely focus on the energy. Um, so I think, um, when you think about design research, um, I think uh, I think myself as a, a kind of a traditional, typical um, empirical researcher, meaning I rely on a lot of data, empirical data, do a lot of simulation and calculation. Uh, I wouldn't uh, classify myself as a design uh, researcher, um, but I think uh, for the students and uh, particularly for the uh, the graduate student, I assume this is a graduate thesis uh, project. For graduate uh, students, the very, very key things is you have to have a clear questions you want to answer, right? You, you have to have uh, set a clear goal that it, there is either one or set of questions you want to answer throughout the thesis process. Of course, your answer will change, like just like my answer, right? Changed quite a lot, but you need to define a question, uh, an area you want to explore. Um, and the thesis is uh, this wonderful, wonderful, one of a lifetime opportunity for you really to explore something really dear to your heart. And, and also at the same time, you have no, probably you have no idea about, which is okay. <laughs> but, but just to be clear to propose the question, work with your advisor, propose your question and, uh, and craft your question clearly, concisely so that you know what, what, at least in which direction you want to go. Hope this answers your question. Yeah, that was great. That was helpful, very helpful. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions. We have one here from Laura Bianca Pruitt. She says, adding to Tim's question, do you have any recommendations for specifically retrofitting historic buildings? Um, one of the biggest challenges is the town, city, county design guidelines maintain historic integrity or may, that maintain historic integrity often require the use of older, less efficient materials that mm. would blend in. Yeah, thank you for asking the question. My first life cycle assessment actually is compare historic retrofit to building a new building. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows uh, there's no comparison whatsoever. Preserve and retrofit historic building is the way to go. Uh, if you look at a whole life cycle uh, assessment. So uh, I can give you, um, I can send you a lot of good resources uh, if, uh, if someone can send me your email. Um, Cause there are guidelines and actually Canada has quite a lot uh, guidelines for historic preservation. And uh, in US, we have, as far as I remember, uh, there are two, uh, not design guidelines, actually case study. Um, you, can, you can take a look. Oh, I got your email. Um, and then Coleman has a question. Coleman is um, an assistant professor in architecture. Mm -hmm. Actually, he covers a lot of, a lot of, wears a lot of hats. Um, I may have missed your response regarding how net zero would be taught in integrated system design studios. Would you have students begin with passive net zero approaches or the standard systems working toward passive design? Hey, um, we are trying to do this in Maryland. Uh, uh, it's not easy, uh, <laughs> but, it, uh, but basically think of this way. So uh, we all we often tell students uh, it's a triangle sh triangle diagram. So the first step is to exhaust your passive design strategy, right? And use as much as you know of uh, building orientation, window to wall ratio, skylights, and all of those. And this is a base, the bottom, bottom line, the base level. And after you exhaust and use all this passive design strategy, the second step is to do 
uh, the active design, meaning then you can uh, start to think about the highly efficient mechanical systems and uh, some fa fancier or more advanced radiant system and uh, even geothermal system. And that is a second level. And after you thoroughly consider and integrate active system, the next and the last one is to think about adding PV, uh, a PV panel and adding wind turbine, all those uh, green features into your building to offset the energy consumption. So the, the approach is always reduce your energy consumption, reduce your energy demand to the certain threshold uh, so that it make it possible for you to make a net zero energy building. Because the threshold right now, we pretty much know it's around 20 to 25. Uh, it's a uh, 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 UI. So the so if the students can really optimize their design using passive uh, uh, design strategy to reduce the UI to 30, and then we can tell them and we can teach them how to integrate the high those uh, 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 the advanced mechanic system. So uh, the no matter is a net zero energy building or positive uh, energy building, no matter is a new or retrofit building. The starting point is it's 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 the same as we always been doing. Really try to optimize and utilize positive design strategy. That's great. That's helpful. Um, any other questions? We're almost at five. No. Well, Ming, this has been really wonderful, very um, insightful and inspiring. Um, I'm so glad we finally got you because we really have been talking about this since last fall. Um, and I think this is a, a wonderful lecture to start off a lecture series that is about um, kind of testing new waters and trying trying new um, new methods to um, to combat what we've done to this crazy environment. Um, so if there are no other questions, then we will, um, I guess, conclude. Um, so thanks. Thanks a million for taking the time to come and speak to us at Oregon State. And, um, and please keep in touch. And hopefully we can get you to come and lecture at some of our indiv individual classes. That would be great. It's really truly been my pleasure and honor to speak with all of you. And hopefully we can get a chance to say face to face and like have that. a more close conversation or chat. Um, and Tim, Tim um, Leanback has asked that you send the email or the information as well that um, you were going to send to um, I got it. I see that. You see his email? Okay, great. Yep. So our next lecture um, is on October 13th at 4 p.m. And it's the same Zoom. So please tune in. And thanks a million for everyone who came. It was really great to start this lecture off with a, a really good cohort. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.